Okay. Um, and with that, I want to introduce our next keynote speaker, uh, who is uh, an activist and uh, an author. Uh, he's the founder and chairman of the Art Renewal Center, uh, which is the room sponsor for this room, th this ballroom that we're in today. Uh, he's the leading authority on William Bouguereau and co-author of the recently published two-volume catalog resume, William Bouguereau, His Life and Works. Uh, which is just over here behind you, Dallas Bree. Can you hold that up for me just for a minute? This immense doorstop uh, of everything uh, that William Bouguereau ever did. Uh, just a fabulous volume. If you ever have the chance to pick up a copy of this, do it. It's one of, the, one of my treasures in my book collection, this volume of Bouguereau. Um, okay, uh, where are we? Uh, no, no. Uh, yes, uh, uh, Fred uh, received his MA in Art Education from Columbia University, another Columbia grad. I'm seeing a theme here. Uh, he's a well-known collector of 19th century European painting and contemporary real realism. It's my privilege uh, to introduce Fred Ross. Could we, t could we turn off the lights over here above the screen? Is that possible? Can someone take care of that? As long as there's enough light for me to read. <laughs> well, thank you, everybody. And um, uh, I can take out the part of this where I was going to introduce myself. Uh, sorry, I can, I can dispense with the portion that I was going to introduce myself. Uh, Michael did a wonderful job of that. So thank you, Michael. Um, the um, title of my speech is, What is Fine Art and Why Realism? Louder? OK. What is fine art and why realism? Um, it is indeed an honor and a treat to be speaking here at uh, TRAC, the conference, and be able to share my thoughts just what exactly fine art is and why an accurate understanding of the meaning and purpose of fine art leads inexorably to the conclusion that only realism, that is, images based on the real world in which we live, play, and work, are capable of meeting the definition of fine art and are able to meet the highest and most advanced goals to which fine art aspires. To properly explain this, we need to go back to foundational basics. So what is fine art? Artists create things which have meaning to them and which they hope will have meaning to others. The artist wishes to communicate meaning of one sort or another to those who view their work. Therefore, it seems very clear that the purpose of fine art, first and foremost, is communication. Not just any communication, but in particular, those things which give expression to those moments in life that all people have which are experienced as meaningful and emotionally charged. Fine art fills a basic human need in its ability to communicate and capture and express ideas about life and living, which people care about after their basic biological needs are filled. People need to share their lives and feelings with other people. And this is done through communication, which helps give meaning to our lives. Most communication is in spoken and written language. Fine art also communicates which it does best when it successfully captures, depicts, and expresses our shared humanity. How we feel about ourselves, other people, and the world around us. It may be seeking to capture an emotional state of mind, like reverie, jealousy, joy, sadness, fear, etc. Or it may attempt to tell a story, like Gaberti's famous scenes from the Old Testament on the uh, doors of the uh, baptistry, um, in the Plaza Duomo in Florence. Or Norman Rockwell's Home for More. Oops. Ah, problem. Uh, technical. <laughs> all right. You don't have to see that, I guess. Um, you all know what Norman Rockwell's Home for More looks like, I think. And if you don't, you better find it, because it's really a great painting. Uh, if someone with little skill attempts a work of fine art, it will likely be success, unsuccessful or awkward and fail.
just a moment. There you go. Let me just find my place here. But an attempt at fine art was still made as a, opposed to an attempt at craft or fine craft. Failure to achieve doesn't turn fine art into craft or vice versa. All of the other, other crafts and sciences have a utilitarian purpose or a purely decorative purpose. But in fine art, human beings endeavor to look at themselves and others, to contemplate the nature of living as a human being, and to find ways of capturing, expressing, and communicating with empathy, passion, and compassion, the road we must all take between birth and death. So the purpose of fine art is similar in its goal to the purpose of poetry, fine literature, or theater. So based on the above, I posit, the visual fine arts of drawing, painting, and sculpture are best understood as a language, a visual language very much like spoken and written languages. It was developed and preserved as a means of communication. And very much like language, it is successful if communication takes place and unsuccessful if it does not. This simultaneously helps define the term fine art. And fine art, therefore, is one important way that human beings communicate. This realization conversely poses this question. Can it be fine art if it does communicate and does not even attempt to do so. Communication can only occur if the language of the speaker is understood, understood by those who are listening. And an absolute necessity for communication is that the language employed has vocabulary and grammar shared by speaker and listener, writer and reader, and therefore logically by painter and viewer. The earliest forms of written language use simple drawings of real objects to represent those objects as observed in hieroglyphics and the earliest cave drawings. The origins of written language and the origins of fine art overlap in this nearly identical way. Without a common language, there is no communication and no understanding, whether in writing, speaking, or fine art. All three have the uniquely human purpose of describing the world in which we live and how we feel about every aspect of life and living. As a language, Fine art is like all of the other hundreds of spoken and written languages that are capable of expressing the enormous limitless scope of human thought, ideas, beliefs, values, and especially our feelings, passions, dreams, and fantasies, all the varied experiences and stories of humanity. So I think my watch is going off here. There we go. Um, the vocabulary of fine art are the realistic images that we, which we see everywhere throughout our lives. The grammar is made up of the rules and skills needed to successfully and believably render the images and ideas and seamlessly connect them together. Here are some of the rules of, or grammar which hold together the real objects or vocabulary of the visual language of fine art. Finding contours, modeling, manipulating paint to create shadows and highlights, with the use of glazing and scumbling. Uh, uh, selective focus, perspective, foreshortening, compositional balance, balancing warm and cool color, lost and found shapes and lines, etc. You know them all. Now ponder this self-evident truth. Even our dreams and fantasies, as well as all, all stories of fiction, which are not real, are expressed in our conscious and subconscious minds by using real images none which look like modern art. Therefore, non-objective abstract painting does not reflect the subconscious mind like they claim. Dreams and fantasies do that, and artwork can also do that, but only by using real images and assembling them in ways that feel like fantasies or dreams. And um, we have a few, um, Vern uh, changing some images on there that are examples of Jerome's um, Pygmalion and Galatea, and this is now John William Waterhouse's Apollo and Daphne, and uh, this is Edward Byrne Jones's Wheel of Fortune, all great masterpieces of the 19th century. Compare these now to two artists who are considered amongst the greatest abstract expressionists, William de Kooning, de Kooning and Jackson Pollock. <clears throat> Let's 
stick it together here. What is being communicated in these two modernist paintings? And which method of working is more successful a way of communication, realism or abstraction? Furthermore, the vocabulary of traditional realism and fine art has something which makes it unique and important. And in one important way, the language of traditional realism cuts across all other languages and can be understood by all people everywhere on earth, regardless what language it is they speak and write. Thus, realism is a universal language that enables communication with all people from all over the earth and past, present, and future. Modernist and abstract art is the opposite of language because it represents the destruction of the language of fine art and is therefore the absence of language. The absence of language means the loss of communication. It takes away from mankind perhaps our most important char characteristic, that which makes us human, the ability to communicate in depth, detail, and sophistication. And in the case of fine art, the modernist paradigm banished the only, the only universal language that exists, realistic imagery with the techniques and skills required to achieve it. This knowledge had grown and developed and carefully was documented and preserved as it was passed down for centuries from masters to students. The artist tries to express her, his or her feelings about life and to communicate with others through their art. The artist has found a constructive way to deal with the truth of human existence, the knowledge that we all die. Instead of shaking their fist at eternity and being overcome by sadness, hate, and depression, to quote Dylan Thomas, the artist rages at the dying of the light, seeking to overcome for themselves and their audience the basic loneliness of existence. They strive not to be engulfed by despairing the brevity of life or the absence of meaning that we face in the wake of the certainty of death and the certainty of loss. Focusing on these negatives leads to an absence of meaning, which is the central belief of existentialism. It's no wonder, then, that the existentialism would espouse modern art or that modern artists would associate their work to existentialism. Fine art finds meaning instead by using the infinite creativity of the human soul and the limitless brilliance within the human brain to find endless ways of communicating with each other about our difficult and differing journeys and odysseys that can and do occur through life. The essence of fine art had always been to express things which people find as meaningful, whether religious paintings of the early and high Renaissance or the genre paintings of the 17th and 19th century. We are all born helpless, utterly dependent, and profoundly ignorant about who we are and what lies ahead. We all yearn to be loved, to be understood, and we all need and want mentors. We want them to be kind and patient and to teach us what we need to know about life and navigating society. We want to be respected. During adolescence, we invariably explore paths to happiness which can be dangerous or destructive. We all want to find work that inspires us and is fulfilling. We want families, and if we have children, we want, we want to be good parents and to, be, to offer better lives to them. We all must endure sickness and the eventual pain of death and witness those we love suffering. Human beings all have universal and shared characteristics as well as an infinite variety of unique and differing traits which constitute our differing personalities. We all want and need love and companionship, warmth and friendship. We also have pride and are vulnerable to having our feelings hurt or to being ridiculed or feeling envy or jealousy. Fine art can deal with all or any of the seemingly endless array of feelings and experiences that benefit, excite, terrorize, or plague humanity. This is the broader definition of beauty and the fundamental aesthetics that define fine art. The artist is said to be successful who can communicate some portion of human experience and to do, do so with beauty, poetry, and grace. As with prose, poetry, or theater, there are subtle and nuanced ways to express ideas and feelings and to captivate and inspire one's audience. Or there are blatant, self-conscious, awkward, inane, childish attempts which fail as works of art, as well as an endless continuum of degrees of success or failure in between. People often ask how sad or negative subject matter can be beautiful. 
The beauty is achieved by poetically communicating some aspect of the human condition with empathy so that the viewer or audience can relate to how it might feel to actually live through some unhappy or horrible experience. Or perhaps they have already lived through such an experience which evokes similar emotions. The artist is telling a story that has strong meaning due to some aspect of their personal history. Um, Wartime Pieta by Max Ginberg comes to mind here. The viewer says to themselves, either consciously or subconsciously, I know how you feel. Fine art helps people connect with one another and can even act as a pressure valve releasing tensions and can reduce the likelihood of conflict. Uncomfortable or unpleasant subjects may not be pretty, but they can be very beautiful and we can learn from them. Modern works with their indecipherable meanings can do the opposite, alienate and agitate. Often modernist works are praised for doing just that. Their stated goals are often to shock or insult. Often when criticizing a movie or a show of work or a work of art, we hear many people say, it doesn't speak to me. It doesn't do anything for me. What they're saying is it doesn't communicate to them or at least not about something they care about. Most people who view abstract, minimalist, or other modern art forms, you will hear say that. Those in the modernist movement will say that they are ignorant and not sophisticated enough to see what's there. In other words, it's not the fault of the artists that their labors have produced something that doesn't communicate. It's the fault of the viewers for not having learned the modernist rationale for making objects without meaning. But when it comes to great theater, poetry, or prose, most people can understand what is being said and intuitively find the beauty that does speak to them. Academically trained realist artists of the 19th century were accused of being elitist. But what could be more elitist than saying, only we enlightened can understand what Rothko, Warhol, De Kooning, and Pollock were saying. If we don't like it, they say, you are all too ignorant, tasteless, and clueless to get, to get it. They call realist art simple and less sophisticated. But its meaning is too obvious and easy to understand. In other words, if a work succeeds in the primary purpose for which it was created, human communication, that very success becomes the reason it is denigrated. The living realist of today, as well as all realist artists of the past, were expressing universal themes and reaching out to all people of all time. What could be elitist about that? Realist painting of the past, as well as those today, are intended to bring humanity closer together to empathize with humanity. Let us once and for all put a spike through the heart of the modernist argument that realism is trite, petty, inane, and devoid of meaning. For if that is true of technically skilled realism, then it would equally have to be true of all poetry and literature, which also uses a vocabulary and structure, which are recognizable by viewer and reader, speaker and listener, as it is too by painter and viewer. In theater, the task at hand is whether the playwright, director, and actors can enable the audience to suspend disbelief. They endeavor to create a world in which the storyline of their play or movie takes place. For this to work, the things that happen, the business and the dialogue, need to be seamlessly worked together in a manner that feels logical and believable. Even in magical realism, science fiction, and fantasy, the goal is to make it all feel possible. We all know that the movie or live show has been carefully written and orchestrated. <clears throat> each word that is said, every movement the actors make, and each element of the set design, backdrops, and props that appear or, seen, or that are seen or used have all been planned, usually down to the smallest detail. The actors need to make it seem like they are saying their lines as if they were spontaneous responses to the things that might be said in the situation or circumstance being portrayed. Indeed, some directors encourage ad-libbing from their actors to enhance believability. But careful planning is the underlying truth of what is going on. For a theatrical performance to succeed as a work of art, it all must seem to be happening spontaneously as it would in real life. In that context, the writer can explore ideas about life that he or she chooses. <clears throat> Whether it is about poverty caused by an indifferent or malevolent government or corporations, as seen in The Grapes of Wrath, or the waste of life and the ennui and indolence that accompanies inherited wealth in The Great Gatsby, or the injustices 
and corrupt society and its effect on otherwise good people, portrayed in Les Miserables. All these books have been made into successful theatrical productions and films that can be said to have reached a level of fine art through the language of theater with its similar vocabulary and grammar of realism. They have culminated in productions that suspend the audience's disbelief and they have each created their own unique forms of beauty. <clears throat> Excuse me. In poetry, two good examples would be Omar Khayyam's Rubiat or Robert Frost's Stopping by Woods on a Snowy Evening. Both poems are about confronting death and characterize how to live one's life, knowing that the Grim Reaper lies just over the horizon. These two poems use the language and words <coughs> of words, the language of words to deal with difficult subject matter in a beautiful way, and all the images conjured are ones from our experiences in reality. If the structure of a work of art is awkward or self-conscious so that the details of how it has been constructed is evident to the listener or viewer, the artist or author is thought to have failed. In theater, if the writing is fine, <coughs> but the acting is terrible, then we might blame the actors or the director. <clears throat> but in every case, you have a work of art constructed from elemental parts and assembled by the writer, director, composer, musician, actor, singer, dancer, painter, or sculptor in a work that is highly organized and embedded with a level of sophistication only found in we human beings. The importance in understanding this underlying process becomes evident if we now look at the debate that has occurred between modernist, modern versus traditional art, the modernist artists who are credited with the origins of modernism are celebrated for pointing directly to the underlying reality of what fine art is constructed from. Cezanne, Manet, and Matisse, we are all told, showed us the truth that a painting is really just colored paint applied to a flat canvas or surface. Modernism <clears throat> claimed traditional realism as taught in the art academies throughout the 19th century, they claimed was engaged in lying to the public, trying to make the flat canvas look like three dimensions, trying to use drawing, modeling, and perspective to create illusions of space, trying to make you believe that you are perhaps looking into a room where people are doing something or, or at a landscape outdoors. All deceptions and lies, the job of the artist then during modernism's 20th century ascendancy was to make painting have value by focusing on the one aspect of what a painting was that no other art form had, which was the flatness of the picture plane. Focusing on the formal underlying fundamental compon components of art became more important than focusing on why art existed in the first place, which was to communicate ideas, feelings, values, and beliefs, and all human experience. Art's purpose was to justify itself, which ironically pretty much canceled out all of its purpose and value. Here is a quote from Clement Greenberg, one of the gurus of the origins of modernism. <clears throat> it was, quote, it was this the stressing of the ineluctable flatness of the surface that remained, however, more fundamental than anything else to the processes by which pictorial art criticized and defined itself under modernism. For flatness alone was unique and exclusive to pictorial art because flatness uses the only condition painting has. Whoops. Get one of these pages thick. <clears throat> that painting has shares with no other art. Modernist painting oriented itself to flatness as it did to nothing else. The truth was that there were no people, no landscape, no real objects to paint other than the concrete reality of the paint and the canvas. The artist endlessly pointing directly to his underlying materials was the birth of modern art. Cezanne flattened the landscape. Matisse flattened our homes and families. And the abstract expressionists like de Kooning, Stella, and Pollock put it all in a blender and threw it at the canvas. Thus making flat color design the end goal of the artist. Expressing and communicating human emotions was not a worthy purpose for art, and so all human emotions were denigrated by, the, were denigrated by them as petty sentimentality. <clears throat> the equivalent of this system of thought applied to written languages would be to say that all writing is untruthful, 
and finding the truth can only be discovered by pointing directly to the underlying materials and structure of written words. All that is really there on the page are different shapes of straight or curved or squiggly lines, since that is closer to the truth than placing meaning in those shapes and lines. Then using them to make words and the words to form ideas, that too must be a lie and an unworthy purpose for the writer. This is an exact analogy. <clears throat> to bring the analogy full circle, the best book would be one that demonstrates this truth with page after page of meaningless shapes and squiggles, thus showing us the modernist profound definition of truth. How many books and poems would be purchased and read in which all that could be found between the covers were meaningless shapes on every page? Modernism endows the meaningless with meaning. Each of us must decide for ourselves whether there is meaning there to be found and if that meaning has great value or any value. Isn't it just as much a part of the truth that the artist who wishes to express a shared human emotion needs to hide the flatness of the picture plane in order to enable the viewer to suspend disbelief the same way that works in theater? The truth of fine art is not that it's just a flat plane with colors on it, but the artist using the flat plane and colored paints needs to overcome that major limitation of their materials by creating a scene in which the three dimensions of the real world are mimicked sufficiently well so that he can design and compose a painting on a two-dimensional surface that can communicate the complexities of a moment in life in three dimensions. Since all such moments occur in 3D, the artist needs to mimic that world to bring their ideas to life. Is it petty and banal to show romantic and familial love and caring? Or is it petty banality to spend one's career insisting that the only paintings that have value those are those with, which demonstrate that they are flat? What then is fine art? And for that matter, what is fine literature, music, poetry, or theater? In every case, human beings use materials supplied by nature, the clay, the colors, the materials of the earth, and the movements and the sounds of life, and creatively combine or mold them into something else which is capable of communication and meaning. It is that ability to communicate, whether subtle or blatant, complex or nuanced, wherein the value of art lies and makes it worthy of the term fine art. Modernists like to say, why waste your time doing realism? It's all been done already. That would be exactly like saying, why waste your time writing anything? It's already all been written. There's nothing left to say. Illustration is often thought of as a lesser form of art. Often we hear people say something like, that's only an illustration, it's not fine art. However, given the clear description of what fine art is, that no longer makes any sense. All fine art is illustration. What is different is what is being illustrated and then how well it has been accomplished. If you look at illustrations in young children's books, often those illustrations are done quickly and the cost and time involved in creating them plays a big role when writers or publishers choose them. However, there are illustrations for books and poems which have been created by some of the greatest artists. Gustave Doré illustrated Dante's Inferno, and he also illustrated Edgar Allan Poe's The Raven. Edmund Dulac illustrated Edward Fitzgerald's translation of The Rubaiyat by Omar Khayyam. And of course, Michelangelo painted the Sistine Chapel ceiling with illustrations inspired by the, from the Bible. All of the early and high Renaissance artists illustrated scenes from the Old and New Testament, Testaments. 19th century artists illustrated Shakespeare, poetry, and myths and legends. The attempt to pigeonhole images that tell a story as illustration, which has been separated in many art schools as a lesser form of art, is strictly a tactic to degrade all realistic fine art and to further entrench modernist ideology. Since all fine art is representational, and since only realistic objects, figures, and settings are capable of complex communication, one is drawn to the logical conclusion that all illustration belongs in the category of fine art. The differences are qualitative, a difference in degree, not a difference in kind. Once we recognize that, we can see the variation in quality can be enormous and may even be useful to make an attempt to create categories along a continuum, but very difficult to do so. <clears throat> uh, possibly along uh, the lines of quality, purpose, 
success or failure of the art or artist, communicator, or illustrator, what is intended. <clears throat> there also can be qualitative differences in subjects and themes. Some themes are about more powerful emotions or moments during life and therefore have greater potential for achieving something beautiful. For example, a painting illustrating wartime wives in 1944 listening to a radio broadcast for the names of the men who were killed has vastly more potential than a simple bowl of fruit or a painting of a can of soup. Therefore, illustration and fine art are basically one and the same. All fine art illustrates something. Based on these truths, the artwork of this year's, in this year's Arc Salon competition and the, and the art uh, done by the artists here at TRAC, at the TRAC conference, can now be readily viewed and interpreted without the prejudicial tenets of modernism, ready to denigrate any work constructed by images from the real world. Many of the best works exhibited here are sure to generate compelling discussions and analysis and a vast array of differing opinions as, what has, as to what has been said and accomplished. It is very much our goal to break through the restraints placed on artistic thought over the past century and open up the limitless source of innovative subjects, ideas, and compositions that are available throughout the real world. And by so doing, encourage a vast rebirth of creativity for artists to enable unshackled critical thought and analysis for those who love and seek out and acquire fine art. <clears throat> it's Waterhouse's um, Lady of Shalott, one of the great works at the Tate Museum. Let us talk now about modernism's obsession with being original. In fine art, the claim that it's all been done before places an impenetrable, impenetrable wall of hopelessness in front of any creative pursuit. Imagine becoming a doctor and not being required to learn what is already known. Knowing doesn't stop you from doing something new, but it keeps you from wasting your time on searching for knowledge that already exists and is readily available. It also decreases the chance of making very serious mistakes. The refusal to learn from the past will inevitably prevent anything new from actually being discovered as breakthroughs are always built on the discoveries of those who came before. In the arts, the fear of doing what has been done before places a ball and chain on your mind and on the joy of creativity, one of the greatest joys of life. Only someone who has learned what is already known can strive to create fearlessly and will have any chance of actually creating something new. <clears throat> For invariably, humankind has a history of creative accomplishments going back thousands of years. So someone who is creative will surely stumble upon many things that have been thought of and done before in advance of achieving the truly original. And if we are honest, the most favorite subjects that we all love are as old as humanity itself, and there are unlimited and original ways in which they can be expressed again and again and again. Modernism, in its need to banish anything seeming unoriginal, has banished all of the tools and skills with which original works, work, with, with, excuse me, with which original work was accomplished, and then tells their artists, without skills and without tools, to go and create worthwhile works of fine art. Since there is no meaningful language in their art, a thousand words are needed to imbue it with meaning. Actually, the words have to be incredibly creative and shrewd to convince otherwise educated and intelligent people that something of value is present when little or nothing is there. Modernists create art that is about art, art about art. All the great art of the past is art about life. A painting should no more attempt to make the viewer conscious of the paint and the canvas than the writer should make the reader conscious of the type of paper being used. Or for that matter, the filmmaker should make the audience endlessly aware of the kind of cameras being used or that the movie is actually composed of a fast-moving series of still images. The real resurgent realist artists, whose ranks are rapidly expanding in the 21st century, consider their materials and skills as a vital means of communicating artistic subjects and ideas. Modernism banished the real world from the tools that could be used. Of course, without the full vocabulary of the real world to draw and to draw from, there is no way for artists to express complex or subtle ideas. After all, 
Any three-year-old who is taken into a museum knows that the canvases there are all flat. How great then was it that Cezanne and Matisse spent the rest of their careers saying it over and over again? Is there any need in these abstract works to suspend disbelief? Or is belief instead compelled, not by the acting, writing, drawing, or painting, but instead by the intimidation of power and position? Do students believe in this new inheritor of Western art, or does not believing in it threaten their grades and positions and the wallets of those invested in such art? It is amazing how the need to avow one's belief repeatedly in something that was previously difficult or impossible to believe will become increasingly easier when supported by figures of authority. A useful term for this phenomena is prestige suggestion. What modernists have done has been to aid and abet the destruction of the only universal language by which artists can communicate our humanity to, well, humanity. They then have built up a labyrinth of justifications and blocked all other viewpoints. If the history of what actually took place is not to be lost due to the transitory prejudice and tastes of a single era, then we must question any practice that deliberately suppresses documented evidence. Art history must not be reduced to little more than propaganda directed towards market enhancement for valuable collections passed down as wealth conserving stores of value. Successful dealers who derive great wealth by selling works created in hours instead of weeks or months had little trouble lining up articulate, eloquent, and persuasive masters of our language to build complex portrayals presented everywhere as brilliant analysis to justify what are really very uncomplicated, unsophisticated, and simplistic works, creations which argu arguably should have and would have been rejected out of hand, but for their disingenuous and cunning sophistry. There is a difference between value due to prestige suggestion and value due to intrinsic quality. Surely in the search to define beauty, we need to understand that difference. We should be able to see through prestige and determine when we are in the presence of the truly beautiful versus of work that's greatest quality is the prestige attached to the name of the artist or the movement. In this way, a canvas with little intrinsic value that has the signature of de Kooning, Pollock, Rothko, or Mondrian on it are assigned high values we call, because people with a PhD or the title of professor or museum director next to their names have told us what to think about their worth. Then major dealers or auction houses have assigned estimates uh, even with of millions of dollars to their work. Most people do not feel themselves knowledgeable enough to know what has or, what has or does not have value, relying on what authorities tell them. This is prestige suggestion. Even if their instincts are to reject something, they keep silent lest they expose themselves to ridicule for being considered ignorant, tasteless, or out of touch, succumbing in fact, to social pressure. Along with prestige suggestion, there is a second very useful term that aids us in understanding what has occurred and how modernism, after gaining ascendance, has been able to maintain its position. That term is called art speak. Art speak is a contrived form of language which uses self-consciously complex and con convoluted combinations of words to impress, mesmerize, and silence opposition. Arc speak attributes to modernist works glorious positive qualities which are just, just not there. Art speak is generally used by people in positions of power and authority and in combination with prestige suggestion is ultimately employed to silence contrary instincts and ideas to prevent people from identifying honestly what has been paraded before them. Art speak, uh, on, on arc we have it defined as a way by which complex sounding words and concepts are used to create the illusion of something being more than it is, a method to create value, meaning, and importance that drastically outweigh what is actually there. Sotheby's contemporary department said that Cy Twombly's epic 1964 canvas titled Untitled Rome is one of the highlights of our contemporary art evening auction on February 12, 2014, unquote. But what is even more amusing is the video created around about the piece for the sale, 
If one looks at it objectively, we can see that the painting really looks like the type of doodling that many people's two-year-old children do. At one point, the video flashes to a scribble with pencil and says, it shows the artist's growing confidence. Evidently, there are many in the art world who think adult scribbling like children is something people should be willing to pay big bucks for. Although the piece does, not, does look exactly like one a child could do, this doodle sold for 12 million British pounds, or 20 million dollars. Um, do we have the uh, link, uh, Vern? Rome by Cy Twombly has never been seen publicly. It's a complete rediscovery, and it's been in a private collection for 45 years. Twombly's work displays an intensely physical human engagement with the canvas. He was inspired by ancient graffiti found in Pompeii and Rome and followed his inspiration to refine his gestural style. On the works, we can see the artist touched in the process of creation. We're able to vividly experience the emotion Twombly felt in smearing hand mags onto the canvas or scrawling text directly onto the work. His text is sometimes legible and sometimes not and serves as a direct link to the past. Twombly chose to abandon America in favor of Rome permanently in 1957. This was an unusual move at the time because the art world was unquestionably beginning to move in the opposite direction. For Twombly, this was partly inspired by his deep love of the history, poetry and myths of Mediterranean Europe. These themes began to enter his work. This one shows the growing confidence of Twombly. He allows himself to become less constrained by an initial subject and rather blends all his own influences into this work. I mean, how intelligent, educated people, how intelligent, educated people could be so hoodwinked is mind-boggling. I mean, it, from the first time modern art was shown to me, I thought I was in a crazy house. And then the, 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 the sense of indignation, uh, if you questioned it. So, <clears throat> I also have a, another, um, I had a couple, but I, one in particular I want to read to you. Um, uh, it's a quote from Catherine Perret uh, describing trends in modern and postmodern art. Uh, Catherine Perrette is an um, associate professor of modern and contemporary aesthetics and theory at Nanterre University in Paris. She's widely published and accepted as an authority on modern and postmodern art. <clears throat> Quote, Take Marsilio Ficino and or Giovanni Pico as examples. Their thinking typically placed the reign of significance in between the vast remoteness of spiritual infinity and the baseness of present materialism therefore concentrating on the zone of transformational actions of humans that lead to a natural ma magical alchemy. This noology is about knowledge that can transform things and states of the system. In that sense, I am maintaining that we are leaving the age of sterile reductive analysis and entering into one of fecund synthesis, much like the poetic mythic scientific age of the early Renaissance. The binding force of this synthesis is certainly intersubjective pleasure and a lust for yeasty comprehensions out of which new possibilities grow. These comprehensions are obtained by experiment, chance, inner risk, though need not be verified or repeated. Indeed, they should not be. It is about a search for originality in that sense. The new noology's validity is obtained through the force of its correspondences and its breadth of connectivity. The resulting pan panoramas will luxuriate this era and be the counterattack to fundamentalist repression as its Im imminence will supersede our mistrust of irrationality and lead us into a qualitative approach by escaping lockdown definitions. In some ways, it is the development of Nietzsche's gay science. There it is. The writer now throws in a poli political correctness. <laughs> as an insurance policy to make sure no one will question or oppose what was said. After all, it's Nietzsche's gay science. <laughs> Who would risk the wrath of educators and the entire intellectual community? By calling her ideas gay science, any opponent or contrarian might be labeled an anti-gay bigot. 
It's just silly and gratuitous, and it's clearly, it's clearly just double talk. I must tell you uncategorically and without any equivocation, there is no idea, concept, or thought which cannot be expressed with direct and fairly simple language. But simple language would not work as well to be confusing. If the words could be readily understood, opposition would be far more likely. The authority of high positions and the authority of books and publications and the authorities of certificates of accreditation and even here the authorities of political correctness attached to the names of the chief proponents of modernism all work in combination to impress, humble, and silence those whose common sense would otherwise rise up in opposition. Without a doubt, people otherwise would clearly see this art for what it is, evident nonsense. For its supposed value had not, if its supposed value had not emanated from the pretentious mouths and pens of those with such a preponderance of authority to back them up. Many students and even teachers have come forward to report how traditional realism has been virtually or actually banned from their art departments. They want to share their sufferings at the hands of modernism educators and ask what they can do. I mean, we have hundreds of letters like that over the years. Banning of ideas and not permitting free and open debate has been a problem throughout history, most often relating to religion or politics. It rears its ugliness in other fields as well. John Stuart Mill's remarks on speech suppression <clears throat> are as alive and accurate today as they were 200 years ago. Quote, where there is a tacit convention that principles are not to be disputed, where the discussion of the greatest questions which can occupy humanity is considered to be closed, we cannot hope to find that generally high scale of mental activity which has made some periods of history so, mar so remarkable. And this additional quote, however unwillingly a person who has a strong opinion may admit the possibility that his opinion may be false, he ought to be moved by the consideration that true it may be if it is not fully, frequently, and fearlessly discussed, it will be held as dead dogma and not a living truth. Without a dynamic living network of experts teaching technical knowledge and drawing and painting, it will never be possible for college and university art departments to have students who are able to enrich the debate and the academic environment for all students by producing works of art that are capable of expressing complex, vital, and spirited ideas. <clears throat> to forbid these skills to be taught on campus in any real depth is as ridiculous as having a music department that refuses to teach the circle of fifths or only teaches three or four notes from which they insist all music must be composed. It's even worse than that, actually. It is as absurd as having an English department in which all words that had recognizable meaning were forbidden and only writing without words or sentences structure would be admissible. If there was nothing to be ashamed of in their teaching methods and in their results, they would welcome the chance to confront the ideas that they should be well equipped to refute. They have a solemn duty to maintain that the integrity of thought made possible by what has been handed down to them by those artists, writers, and thinkers before us who established a vast, complex, and rich system of training with which to teach and pass on a wealth of knowledge. Deliberately preventing access to this information is crippling to the goals of education and a, severe, <clears throat> excuse me, and a severe obstruction to ensuring a society based on freedom of thought without which progress is impossible. Where is it more important to vouchsafe these principles than at our nation's college and universities who have a duty to expose their students to responsible opposing views in all fields of study? Traditional skill-based art in recent decades has had very few proponents, ceiling, ceding nearly a century to an ascendant modernist leviathan. Ironically, that century has seen the greatest strides forward in every other field of human endeavor. If the proponents of realism are as correct as it seems, the art world is woefully behind our times and will need to do a lot of catching up. The new realism movement now has thousands of artists that is a staggering turnaround from the handful who were working 30 years ago. There are over, are over 70 ARC-approved uh, academies and, and atelier-based schools today, and there are about a half a dozen waiting for vetting now, and we know about 15 or 20 others we have to look at. <clears throat> and there are dozens of organizations helping to support the efforts of these artists.
There are many upscale art galleries in major cities throughout the world who concentrate on art with images from the real world. You have all taken great strides forward and reclaim our centuries-long heritage in realist fine art. We are now seeing solid indications of the rich creativity developing at the heart of the 21st century art world. The exhilaration and optimism which flows forward from here could not be more thrilling or exciting. I can't wait to see the magic and beauty that is in store for us as you artists are inspired by an avalanche of original perspectives, innovative methods, and brilliant game-changing subject matter of a rapidly growing realist movement. As artists share their ideas together, seeding and cross-pollinating a landslide of creative and innovative thinking that will lead us to ever more poetic, inspirational, and beautiful artwork in the studios, salons, and exhibitions in the years that lie ahead. Just halfway through the second decade of the first century of this, the third millennia, we are truly at the very beginning of a new era that celebrates the beauty and poetry of the human soul. Thank you. I just, I just have to say one more thing that um, uh, we're, we're, uh, we um, forgot to tell you earlier in the uh, three days. Um, hopefully most of you know already that the winners of the ARC's most recent competition are traveling first to Barcelona, where they will be exhibited at the Me Museum on its main floor, and at the same time, on the, first, the next floor up, they will be exhibiting the winners of their yearly European figure toss competition, nearly as large as ARC's. And, we'll, um, and starting on November 16th, the show will run six weeks and then go for an additional three weeks to the Salamagundi Club in Manhattan, where we have seven or eight really uh, interesting events planned. So if any of you can make it to the opening, please do. And if not, to some of the events that are planned. We don't have them all posted yet, so I can't tell you what they're going to be. But I've heard some of the ideas, and I think it's going to be worthwhile. Um, I hope to see you all there. Thank you again. Oh, yeah, that's right. Any questions? <laughs> can, can you turn the lights up for me? <clears throat> okay, who has a question? Any? Uh, please catch my eye. Uh, I'll be scanning. The Did I, I said it all? <laughs> no. All right. Yes, sir. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, uh, Fred, uh, where do you see uh, the future in? Well, I know what our goal is, and I know what has been accomplished in the last 10 to 15 years is phenomenal. Um, back in 1980, I, we searched everywhere. We could find only seven tiny schools uh, that had between five and ten students per school, and they were all pretty much run by students of Ives Gamel, who deserves immense credit for having kept alive the traditions from the prior centuries. I mean, he had been a student of William Paxton, who was a student of Jean-Leon Jerome. And you can trace that lineage back to David and, and, the, and the days of Napoleon, and from David back to the High Renaissance. So, um, uh, and his teaching now, um, and then I believe the lineage through uh, Anagoni, um, uh, there is now um, so many schools and so many more being planned. Um, and, and the Da Vinci Initiative that Arc um, started by Mandy Hellenius over here, who's done an incredible job, is bringing skill-based training to public schools, K through 12. And um, uh, with immense uh, success in just 18 months since they started. Um, for example, um, Jersey City um, required all 64 teachers in their art departments in that city to go to skill-based training at Florence Academy's Jersey City um, uh, School that just opened uh, very recently. And she's made, um, she's made presentations, is it 20 states now that have accepted presentations? And she's the president of the board, of, of the, or about to become the president of the Board of Education in the state of Washington. And she has national prominence and it's growing by leaps and bounds. And she and my daughter, Kara Ross, 
have started this whole um, project, and it's just growing by leaps and bounds. Uh, how, where are we going to be in five to ten years? I hope so far ahead that none of us could have guessed it would have been there. <laughs> we, none of us could have guessed ten years ago we'd be here. <laughs> yes. Going through the back door. It's a reintroduction of the language. Yes, that's right. It's a basic language. That's right. It's a reintroduction, education of the language of realism. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, oh, yes. Okay, sorry. This is his daughter, by the way. <laughs> he was after all a bad boy. Um, <laughs> but the, um, what I see now is a lot of the training of Peter's is being done in universities as opposed to ateliers. So I know what's being taught in the studio law and the interaction between master and students. Do you dare hope that the training of Peter's will move back to smaller ateliers away from an academic That's a very good question, and I know many of us have been hoping to get ateliers embedded in colleges and universities, but your comments are an argument for wanting just as many, if not more, totally independent from that process. It's because so many parents think that they need their children to be going for degrees from accredited institutions that they feel the need to, to that so many of the schools feel the need to look in that direction. But in truth, you're not going to make the best artists necessarily that way. Well, in, the, in our field, it doesn't give them any of the skills they need to, for the, to do what they're supposedly being trained to do. So um, that's very true. And the costs are ridiculous now. 60000 a year, I've heard. That's mind-boggling. When I went to school, it was 3000 a year, and that included room and board and tuition. Ricky. Sorry. Yeah, I, I, this is an ongoing debate in the realist community because they're afraid of, of getting, causing ire in the, and, and, and attacks from people who are obviously have more resources. But um, uh, and they, 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 don't have, they have thought nothing about uh, um, attacking us uh, in every possible way and denigrating everything about realism. Uh, and it's ugly and it's untrue. and. Uh, and um, uh, I've, I've, I personally prefer um, 
attacking it head on. But that's me. I mean, I know a lot of people prefer hoping that they can find people who are moderate and middle of the road who will be willing to let some realism in through the side door or back door or any door. Um, but um, uh, there is obviously more and more people who are seeing the truth here. And um, I, at some point it will hit a titration point. Uh, if you know anything about chemistry, a titration is when you know, they're adding one li clear liquid into another liquid, and when it hits a certain percentage, it turns red suddenly with the last drop and the whole solution turns red. And, um, and at some point, we're going to hit a titration point in this turner, and suddenly it'll, it'll be an avalanche. When the bottom falls out of the, of, of the modernist market, it will fall so fast and heavy uh, uh, it'll fall 10 times faster than the prices on Bougaros and Alamitanimus did in the early 20th century. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Another one? Oh, yeah. Sherry? My wife. Not with young children, certainly. You just want them to be enjoy the beauty of the realism. Yes, Lexi. It's not only agree that both are absolutely valid points because it's this solid sort of political correct thing pulled in a way the joy of life of the artwork. If you look at the modernist reality of the modernist debate of the turn of the last century, that was the vibrant vitality of discourse and the debate. That was modernity. Therefore, the pure vitality of entering the discourse and discussing a couple of ideas at their, in a way, extremity, that's what makes artist, uh, artist discourse beautiful and all part of the same discourse. You cannot self censor, practice self censorship in order to fit in. That's right. From the back door, enter or climb in. It's anti art. Because it's the. Pro bureaucracy and anti art. Art, as in a modernist connotation, was anti establishment. If it's not anti establishment in its very definition, it's, it's an insult in the face of Duchamp for, for, for what it was, for what it was, anti establishment drive. Academic art never um, suppressed impressionism the way they said. It's a complete lie and a fiction. It didn't happen that way. But at the, at the end <coughs> of the day, embraced it. Yeah. Yes, they embraced it. That's right. Absolutely. At, at the end of the day, institutions, that's their great future function, that they could make surveys of these opposite views of that debate from various uh, aesthetic standpoints. One thing I think really important to understand, that nobody, at least here, arguing one and the only one the right move. Modernism was a fantastic, important, and great movement and an intellectual exercise of the 20th century. But it does not make any all other forms of expression It's just what happened when they took ascendancy, they suppressed all the prior forms, and so that was that was the real problem. But but uh, what modern what the beginning of modernism was, and where it led to, are two totally different things. Um, yes, there's somebody who's been out there back there trying to ask no, questions. I'm sorry. Max, oh. Max is here. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. <laughs> yeah. Sorry, Max. I didn't see you. Can you speak up, Max? Yeah, I was wondering if you could comment a little further and develop those ideas between illustration, narrative art, and fine art, and in the mix, talk about commercialism as well. No, I know. Frankly, that would be a, probably another hour speech. <laughs> but but it's um, the, the point I was making is that the differences are qualitative. The, the differences are qualitative, and you're feeling that there is a difference between fine art, narrative art, and illustration. Well, fine art and narrative art. I mean, all fine art is narrative in some way, even if it is just a landscape or a bowl of fruit. Uh, it's it's expressing how the artist f feels about 
beauty and what and, and what they find beautiful. But um, uh, it's the term illustration which has been denigrated, and and uh, and I'm just trying to make the point that all fine art illustrates something. So it's not uh, useful to say illustration is bad. It's what's useful is to find different terms that express those differences in quality. That's basically it. Yes. Well, you, there's oh, okay. There's two sides of commercialism. There's a commercialism of artists being used for advertisements or for magazines, that, you know, and then there's um, uh, uh, art made for books, uh, you know, um, and I discussed that a little bit, but um, uh, money is a, is a uh, has been a very useful method of uh, storing value for in, in uh, for society, so that it's possible for uh, anybody to buy anything with a with a form of currency that will be accepted by anybody else in the society. Without it, it would be very chaotic. So, sure, of course, artists have always. I mean, Michelangelo worked for the Pope. I mean, he was given, uh, he was told what, what to do for the Sistine Chapel ceiling. He took those limitations and strictures and turned it into the most magnificent thing practically ever created. So um, uh, the, the limitations of, of, um, of commissions doesn't necessarily limit your um, creativity. It just means that you need to use the creativity within the limits of what the patron has required. But that's why I encourage all artists, no matter how many portraits you paint uh, financially, always do your own work as much as possible. And I, well, I want to I see what an artist thinks is great. And when I buy an artist's work, I want his work. I don't want him to, to do what I asked him to do. I'm oh, sorry, yes, yes. I'm sorry, I've got... Well, you know, the com oh, right. you know, Common Core has become an, uh, 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 even though I don't generally support Common Core because I think it's better to have um, uh, a thousand or a, or a hundred thousand different uh, ways of doing things that are competing for us uh, uh, because that's way you, the way you get the best of the best, not by one me method, one size fits all. It's, it's not the best way to do things. But ironically, the Common Core has created a backdoor for skill-based training to come into the schools uh, precisely because the, um, uh, the, the art departments where they're, they're giving kids colored felt and poster paper and, and macaroni and, um, and, and pictures to cut out of magazines and telling them to make collages, which is going, going on in every school that there is practically, um, there is no, uh, nothing that can fit into common core standards. But skill-based training with all the, the, the rules and, and, and requirements to, to learn it um, meets those standards to a T. I mean, Mandy can talk about that somewhat. If you, if, if you want, to, if you want to say anything about that now. I couldn't hear that, I'm sorry. Yeah, we, I'm sorry, we can't hear you. Can you shout really loud?
there is no, there are no limitations to academic art. That was never true. There were no limitations. The only way, it's actually, you can really unshackle the mind and the, the total range of creativity really breaks free when artists learn the skills so that it's possible for them to create what their mind has, has seen that they want to originate. But without the skills, there's a, the limitations are enormous. Um, what can you do if you couldn't draw anything? I mean, I guess the Cy Twombly piece, you know. <laughs> what? That's right. And, and most people don't really like that stuff. I mean, it's obvious. Most, most people are fearful of being considered ignorant, so they say, I don't understand it. <clears throat> but I tell them they do understand it. That lack of understanding is, uh, is understanding it. It's, there is nothing there to communicate. You're not supposed to understand it. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you.